Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, hey there, church. This week on uh, our podcast, we have Ellen Grosh, our summer intern, who brought us the teaching. This morning, she spent some time in Luke chapter 1 and talking about how we should not fear based on the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And just take a moment and share this excerpt with you where she reads from Luke chapter 2 and Mary's song. Listen to this. The one thing we know about her is that she is the blessed believer, the follower of Jesus. Hear Mary's song once more. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Amen. Amen. If that doesn't get you amped for the actual message itself, I don't know what will, but I hope that you enjoy this first full sermon by Ellen. Well, good morning, Kanoi family. My name is Ellen, and this summer I've been serving as Kanoi's children's ministry intern. You may have seen my face in some of the videos that have been sent out this summer, and I've quite enjoyed making them. And this morning, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about myself to start. I was a theater kid in high school. (laughs) I started performing in church musicals when I was pretty little, and then I started performing in school productions in sixth grade. And I wasn't the most outgoing, and I didn't always like the attention, but something about theater captured my imagination. The thing I love most about acting is when I get to take on a new character. I get to dive deep into their strengths and weaknesses. I think through their flaws and their disappointments in life. We do exercises in theater when we think about um, how we're picking up the character in the script and what led to that moment that we're picking them up. Um, What is their story? What makes them tick? Why are they in the relationships that they're in? And what do they want? And to what length will they go to get what they want? One year, I played the lead character in a musical you're probably familiar with. This character is known for spinning on top of mountains while singing, yodeling, uh, escaping Nazis, and becoming the governess to seven children. This is Maria von Trapp from The Sound of Music. For the rest of high school, I was known in the community as Maria. And the list kept going. Oh, you're that girl that played Maria, right? Hey, I saw you in Footloose and you played the pastor's wife. You made such a wonderful Mrs. Potts. In these people's minds, I was these characters. And for all they knew, I spun on mountain singing and lived a double life as a teapot in an enchanted castle. The character's traits applied to me. While you might catch me singing and drinking tea, those characters are not me. Now let's look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. Who do others think she is? Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. In Luke's introduction to Mary, 
we learn that she is from Nazareth, she is a virgin, she is engaged to Joseph, and a, who is a descendant of David. This information tells us that Mary and her parents have Mary's life put together. She is a good Jewish girl, probably 13 or 14, and at 13, she becomes an adult in Jewish culture. She is engaged to a respectable, well-connected man, and Mary likely didn't have much, much of a say in this engagement, but it's the right thing for her to do to go along with it. All Mary's parents could have ever wanted for their daughter was set. And then this angel shows up in verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. Fear not. There are two things going on behind this fear not. First, an angel showing up in your home is what we can assume blindingly terrifying as we put together from other Bible stories. Second, Mary was going to need courage to take on the angel's message because when the angel Gabriel came to her, her picture-perfect Jewish life was shattered. In accepting the angel's, in accepting the angel's message, her reputation was changed forever. Her engagement was final. The only thing that could break that engagement off would be actually divorce. Would Joseph divorce her for becoming pregnant? Would her parents believe her story or disown her? An unmarried pregnant Jewish teenager, who would want to associate with that? Joseph not only had the right to divorce her, but also to have her stoned. She had shamed him unspeakably. The name-calling and accusations flew around Mary. The titles, the neighbors, family, and friends gave Mary attributed all sorts of narratives to her. But wait, the angel had called her highly favored. Where was this blessedness? We're painting a picture here to help see why Mary would have gotten ready and hurried to Elizabeth, as it says in verse 39. We have to wonder if Joseph had yet accepted his bride. We have to wonder what level of ridicule Mary was facing even from her parents. Her confidence in the angel's words was hanging on by a thread. Once a respectable, unnoticed, but cared for Jewish girl was turned into the town scandal without any explanation. Elizabeth greeted Mary in verse 42. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I wouldn't be surprised if you told me that the mother of Jesus burst into tears of relief at this moment. While Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy had brought honor to her family, Mary's pregnancy had torn her life apart. Elizabeth was picking up the pieces of Mary and declaring in a loud voice who the Lord said Mary was. Rarely will someone else in Scripture ever again call Mary blessed. Here, Elizabeth declares Mary's identity, the one that is getting lost in the swirl of accusations and judgment. Mary is blessed and is to be a blessing to others. She has believed the angel's words, unlike Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband. Elizabeth blessed Mary for believing and declared that this was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary was the blessed believer. We're going to turn to our first time of discussion now. The question is, what are some labels you have received from others in your life, positive or negative or neutral, and who does God say you are? Go ahead. Hello, friends online. Hello, hello. Anyone in the comments want to share 
what you're thinking about for this first question. The question again is, what labels have you received in your life? They could be simple, like mother, daughter, friend. Um, what are you thinking about? Best friend. That's a good friend label. I love that, Wanda. <laughs> Mother, daughter, and reliable. I like that. Oh, hi, Mom. <laughs> um, mother, daughter, sister. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, being pigeonholed into an inaccurate label. And I think that that's one of the things we're talking about is that these labels, some of them we want to accept, and some of them are just placed on us, and we don't agree exactly with their meaning. That was part of my silly example with um, that I'm not actually... A teapot in an enchanted castle <laughs> but that's how some people think of me because that's where they've seen me mm. what hats do we wear that's a good that's a good way of putting that question all right well you guys can feel free to put some things to continue putting things in the chat and I'll see you in a bit all right what are the labels you've been given? Not necessarily the ones you've chosen for yourself, but what have you been given? You can just shout them out. <laughs> you don't want to share? <laughs> well, they can... Oh, we skipped the second question. That's okay. Um, we were talking online that we get these labels uh, starting from the day we're born. We're sons and daughters um, of our parents. We are mothers and fathers, we are grandparents, um, we are friends, we are best friends. Um, anyone else have any labels they want to add in? Loners. <laughs> we, do, we do gain labels that we don't necessarily want in life, too. Both good and bad. Yeah. Mm, smarty pants, know-it-all, teacher's pet. Anyone want to share something they talked about for um, who God says you are? Child of God. Top of the totem pole. <laughs> Prayer warrior. Survivor. Yeah. Champion. Mm. To recap, Mary's identity is from the Lord. She is blessed because she accepted the angel's call, though nobody else would know what had happened. She probably had some idea of the consequences of her actions when she said that she was the Lord's servant, um, but maybe the ridicule was far worse than she could have imagined. So she ran to Elizabeth and stayed there three months. After Elizabeth's declaration, I imagine that she held a weeping Mary as Mary sang her song. As I read Mary's song now, I want you to just listen to the words. I want you to hear the song as someone who has been rejected by all that have, by all that have known them and loved them. Hear the names that Mary gives herself. In verse 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those, who hear, to, to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm, and He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary's words show how much scripture Mary knew about who God was and who God says she is. The song kind of sounds like another piece of scripture that we know. It kind of sounds like a psalm. In the time Mary stayed with Elizabeth, she was soaking in the wisdom and knowledge of Elizabeth and Zechariah. From the line of priests, both Elizabeth and Zechariah knew scripture incredibly well. 
and it poured out of them in their prayers and conversations. At this time, though, we remember that Zechariah cannot speak until the birth of his son, John the Baptist. So, naturally, in my mind, that leaves Elizabeth as the primary speaker of the household, Zechariah probably communicating in other ways. They knew the story of their people, and they also knew that their son would play a role in something larger. And they knew who Mary held in her womb. They were the only two people in the world at the moment for Mary that were putting the pieces of scripture together and anxiously awaiting the future of their sons. They lived every moment expectantly awaiting the birth of their son and the birth of Mary's son. Perhaps part of your upbringing in the church, however long it's been, however long you've been a part of the family, you've learned some scripture. Maybe you've even memorized some things. One of my Old Testament professors loved to have us memorize verses of the Bible. Sometimes we would memorize one verse at a time and sometimes several sections. One of our assignments was to memorize 20 sections of Proverbs. Sometimes they were only one or two verses, but sometimes they were three or four. The weeks leading up to our recitation exam, my classmates and I could be found around campus muttering to ourselves. Uh, it looked something like this around campus. The fear of the Lord is wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And then you just kept going with all the verses as fast as you could, working and working on them. I would say these verses walking, showering, uh, before I fell asleep, or during breaks between other assignments. We focused on scripture with every spare moment. That was one month of my life. Before that month, and after that exam, I didn't go around thinking about scripture every spare moment. What about you? What fills the in-between spaces of your life? In the second section of our sermon series, we're talking about a practice that is part of the Christian life that's been passed down from generation to generation that you might feel God is asking you to take part in. Today, I present to you soaking in scripture. What is soaking? I could have said memorizing, but the goal here is not to memorize a bunch of verses just so you can say you know them. While I believe memorization of scripture is important, I think there's a first step to memorizing, and that is soaking. Have you ever spilled coffee or tomato sauce or something on your clothes that would leave a stain? What do you do to get it out? You have to soak the clothes for hours to get it out. I think we can think of soaking in scripture like this. We have stains in our lives, things that we hold on to, like how the fabric holds on to the color of the stain. We can either keep holding on, or we can soak in the one and only thing that will remove that over time, Jesus, as revealed to us in scripture. Mary had all sorts of staining food and drink thrown at her, metaphorically speaking, but I don't know, maybe really. <laughs> the lies and gossip that swirled around her were starting to get to her, and she felt alone, fighting a battle to keep her identity. From her first moment with Elizabeth, through the three months that they were together, Mary soaked in the, in the truth and scripture that Elizabeth declared over her and showed her. Elizabeth created a safe place for Mary to soak in scripture. As a Jewish woman in the first century, neither Elizabeth nor Mary was educated. They knew their scripture from hearing it in their family prayers and festivals. They took what they heard and they treasured it. They soaked in it. What might it look like for you to have a safe place, however long, to soak in scripture? We're moving beyond a simple statement of read your Bible. Soaking in scripture means slow and thoughtful, reading the same passage over and over again until you feel led to move on to another. It might look like repeating a verse or two over and over again as you find new meaning each time. Soaking in scripture could mean writing scripture down word for word. It could be reading and focusing on one psalm a day or one short story from the Gospels. It could be one verse, one word or phrase at a time. 
soaking, allowing God to work on the things that stain your identity. Maybe God is saying to you, hey, I see you placing your identity on your job and how much money you make. Let's work on that as we soak in scripture together. I have a better identity for you. Or, hey, that lie that you are unwanted or not beautiful, that's not from me. Come, soak with me in the truth that you are beautiful and I want your brokenness. That sin that's keeping you from accepting my love, let's release it. And by redirecting our time and energy to scripture where I can wash you in the words of my love. We believe God's word holds the greatest story ever told, and that story is continuing still today. We won't find its true meaning, though, if we just pick out verses haphazardly. We must engage in the long and slow work of soaking in Scripture, allowing the truth to become more evident to us as we read and ponder. And slowly, these words will be memorized, not in the way that you can recite them, but in the way that they'll come out in your conversations, just like they did with Elizabeth. Let's turn to our second time of discussion. And the question is, what truth from scripture or truths is planted in your heart? God says, beloved, worthy, forgiven, loved. Hmm. I like those words. Love of God, the truth of the love of God. Absolutely. God is love. Yes. We see that from the moment of creation to the end of all things. God is love. God is grace. Yes, one of the most common verses in the Old Testament is about God's um, mercy and loving, compassionate kindness. There's a Hebrew word for that, just, just because it's fun. <laughs> it's called chesed, H-E-S-E-D, and it's the word for God's loving kindness. And we don't have a word for it in English, um, but it's the truth that's sprinkled all over the Old Testament and then culminates in Christ. Truth, we all bear the image of God. Yes. God as the deliverer of blessings. Mm -hmm. How God provides the exact scriptures needed in all circumstances for me to absorb. Amen. To return to them later and to share with others in need. That is the work of the Holy Spirit right there. <laughs> giving us what we giving us words beyond ourselves to encourage others. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. <laughs> yes, the way that we find scripture that relates to us in one moment, we take note of it, highlight it, or write it down somewhere, and um, we keep coming back to it, learning more things and being able to find an opportunity to share that truth with somebody else. Thanks, Sue. I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit. <laughs> All right. You can feel free to keep adding things in. Um, thank you so much for sharing, and I'm so glad. I, I guess I should be looking at this camera. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I could get to sit with you online and have the space to ourselves. I'll see you in there. All right, family, what truth of Scripture is planted in your heart? We have lots of great responses online. We focused a lot on some uh, characteristics of God, like God is love, God is merciful, God is grace. Uh, we're also thinking about uh, God as the deliverer of blessings, that we all bear the image of God. Anyone want to add anything else? Faithful to forgive of anything. 
saved by grace through faith. Anyone else? This is just a truth-sharing time, so let's share the truth. <laughs> yeah. First Peter 4.19 Thank God so that those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Mm. That's when it's all stuff. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. yeah. We need to be reminded to ask for forgiveness, to practice that confession. All right. The third part of our sermons in this series of Fear Not is our Christ connection. As Christians, all of our thinking and connections must point back to Christ. With Mary. <laughs> How much more obvious can you get that she was the mother of Christ, therefore connected to God? <laughs> she was his mother, and her body went through all of the pain and, well, everything else that goes with having a child to give birth to the Messiah. After the time Mary spent soaking in scripture and truth with, with Elizabeth, it seems Mary was renewed in her calling. She returned home. The rumors didn't stop when she returned home, though, and Mary would only accumulate more and more rumors and labels throughout her life. But Mary knew who she was as the blessed mother of the Messiah. The stains on her identity were washed clean. Jesus knew his mother was blessed. But when we look at the handful of times Jesus addressed his mother in the Gospels, we're left a little shocked. Uh, Jesus, <laughs> you can't say that to your mother. Um, such as in Luke 2, when Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, and Jesus asked them, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Quite a response to understand Jesus. Uh, Jesus makes the relationship clear here. His father is God. Again, in John 2, the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turned the water into wine, Jesus says to Mary, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. In my mind, I'm thinking, uh, Jesus, <laughs> she wanted you to help out because she believes that you can do anything. But I think the most shocking is Luke 8, 19 to 21. I'm going to turn there as well. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. And he replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put them into practice. On first reading, this sounds like Jesus kind of has rejected his family. All of the instances sound like Jesus is creating distance, not wanting anything to do with them. But let's think about how Jesus impacted Mary's life from the beginning. When the angel announced Jesus' is coming through Mary, he shook up the identity that Mary had accepted from others that she would be a good Jewish girl and marry this man and have a family and live a quiet life. He shook that up. He redefined who she was entirely, and her life would never be the same. In saying that Mary and her brothers weren't his unless they heard God's word and followed, Jesus is once again giving them a new identity. Jesus redefined the relationship with his mother, choosing spiritual ties over biological. While society told Mary that she was a teenager with a shattered reputation, Jesus called her a follower. While political powers told Mary that she was a forgotten refugee in Egypt, Jesus called her a follower. While the neighbors gossiped about this young mother and her peculiar son, Jesus called her a follower. While the empire and religious institutions placed shame on Mary for having a son die as a criminal on a cross, Jesus called her a follower. Mary, the vulnerable, opened herself to the greater and deeper workings of God because Jesus named her a follower. When she was called to be Jesus' mother, Mary accepted the calling, saying that she was the Lord's servant. 
Jesus continued naming her a follower for the rest of her life. Mary would be a mother, a wife, an outcast, a confusion to those around her, a widow, an ashamed woman. But none of these things defined her or defined her more than Jesus' call on her life. Mary, you are to follow Jesus. In Acts 1.14, we find that Mary is gathered with the other disciples and Jesus' followers when they received the tongues of fire from the Holy Spirit. Mary was then sent to tell the world about Jesus' resurrection. There was no other identity she needed. She was Mary, the follower of Jesus. And that's all he needed her to be. So what's your identity? Who does God say you are? Fear not, for God knows who you are. You are his. You need no other title, accomplishment, or feature. He calls you his follower. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.